Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English and we are spending now a bit of time talking uh, with a text that I want to point out for you has on page 32. Do you see it at the very top of the page? Themes across centuries. I think we already mentioned the fact that we're talking about a thousand years, for example, the Navajo tribes have uh, lived at some place in North America on the continent. And now we're going to take a look at a woman named Susan Power. And if you're reading with me on page 32, a member of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe of Fort Yates, North Dakota. Okay, and she, of course, in her novel, The Grass Dancer, which won a famous prize, the Hemingway Prize for First, uh, for first Fiction, she's also written a book of stories, autobiographical essays called Roof Walker. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at somebody who is living right now, who will comment on what it means to live through the legacy of the Native American culture. So, for example, she knows that the blood that runs in her veins is blood of peoples who lived many, many uh, years before as an indigenous people. They lived here on this land that we call America today, only she herself now lives in the modern world, or what we might even call a postmodern world. And how does she come to terms with that? You're going to be looking now at a, pa at a passage called Museum Indians, okay? Uh, which is in and of itself a very fascinating title. Go ahead and write that title down really quickly if you haven't already. Museum Indians. We're going to first of all say it, to be. We'll just say this right out loud. And to be. This is what we call a personal essay. Now what does that mean? Well, you're asked to respond in some way personally to what it is that you feel how you think, okay? Her topic here is, of course, going to be describing a relationship between her and her mama. Now, that's important to write down at level one. Her and her mother. So you got a mother-daughter thing going on here, okay? But she's going to be reflecting back to when she was a kiddo, when she was young, when she was a child. Her mother is a Dakota woman. She's an inspiring figure. Tall, she's fearless, she's outspoken, she speaks her mind. She will show power, many aspects of Chicago, giving her daughter a sense of her, of her own, her own owning of the city, her own living in the city. Chicago, one of America's greatest cities, of course. She focuses, Power Will, on the museums. Now, let's use this word, write this word down, and then define it really quickly. What is a museum? In our own town here, we have most recently constructed a, you know, a museum. What is that? What is a museum, and what is it for? Well, we might say a museum is a place where they collect junk from the past so people can look at it. I'll ask the five-year-old question, why? Dude, it's old and we don't use it anymore. What is the bloody point? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Why would a culture take a bunch of crap from the past and put it in a building? Second question, why would anybody go and look at it? Now, some of you will say, yeah, dude, they tried to get me to go to a museum once, and I kind of walked around and went, yeah, so what? What's the, what's the big deal? Which begs a really interesting question. When a culture becomes extinct, what is the value of celebrating it in a museum? What is the point of doing that kind of thing? Okay? Reading a passage like this will make us think a little bit maybe differently about the experience of going to a museum. Of course, the word museum is an interesting word, and you can write this down and then look at the line as you have written it down. Somebody has said, schools are museums of lost dreams. Now that's an interesting comment. Schools are museums of lost dreams. Think about what you do in math class. You study a cat named Pythagoras, who invented a theorem called the Pythagorean Theorem. Where is Pythagoras? Yeah. You take a history class where all you do is study about dead people. 
Lincoln is gone. Uh, wait a minute. Pretty much everything you study in school is stuff from the past. Oh, yeah. What is the point of studying all this garbage from the past? What is the point of school? Well, now that's interesting. See, all of a sudden we're thinking about this discussion of museums maybe in a whole different way. Okay. They will visit several of the exhibits, right? And through bits of her stories, we learn that Power's mother is so connected to her Native American culture that she can never be as home, never be able to think about Chicago as home, as she will her daughter. Now, one of the things you want to write down about this text before we read it is this text resurrects the question about how children can learn to appreciate an older culture, a culture of a different kind. Is it inevitable? And see, and some of us have watched this, some of us have been a part of this, where we've grown up in a family where the mother or the father or the grandparents have said, I want you to know about your past. I want you to know about, and then start talking, and the child has a tendency to do what? Seriously, I don't want to hear this. Or, I don't want them at school to think I'm different. I realize you got to speak a different language, but I don't want to speak it. See how that works? And then all of a sudden, what's it like to be an older person? And to say, but no, I want you to know, I want you to know the language of our, of our ancestors. And the kid goes, yeah, I'm not interested. Oh, that's kind of code language for, I'm not interested in your culture. I am a different person. What kind of feelings must the adult have when he realizes or she realizes they're less like we used to be and they're more like the other culture? Is that kind of freaky? See how that works? Let's turn now to the text itself. We'll follow along. We'll take a few notes. Most importantly, we're going to ask this question at level one. How, you might write this question down so you can answer it. How is Susan Power? and her mother, different. Can you come up with three ways? They are different kinds of people. Which at 3B will then ask a really interesting question that you may want to write down. How are you and your parents fundamentally different? How are you different? And of course, for those of us who had a birth parent who is not the person who raised us, that's an even more intriguing question, isn't it? That's like two mixed up questions at times can make it very challenging, right? How are you and your parents different? How will you grow up to be different from them? How much of the past of your family culture will you take with you? How much of it will you walk away from and not be a part of? This text will ask us to kind of think about this. This. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at it now. Here we go. Just again, follow along, making notes as you go. Museum Indians by Susan Power. A snake coils in my mother's dresser drawer. It is thick and black, glossy as sequins. My mother cut her hair several years ago, before I was born, but she kept one heavy braid. It is the three-foot snake I lift from its nest and handle as if it were alive. Mom, why did you cut your hair? I ask. I am a little girl lifting a sleek black river into the light that streams through the kitchen window. Mom turns to me. It gave me headaches. Now put that away and wash your hands for lunch. You won't cut my hair, will you? I'm sure this is a wine. No, just a little trim now and then to even the ends. I return the dark snake to its nest among my mother's slips, arranging it so that its thin tail hides beneath the wide mouth sheared by scissors. My mother keeps her promise and lets my hair grow long, but I am only half of her. My thin brown braids will reach the middle of my back and in maturity will look like tiny garden snakes. My mother tells me stories every day while she cleans, while she cooks, on her way to the library, standing in the checkout line at the supermarket. I like to share her stories with other people and chatter like a monkey when I am able to command adult attention. She left the reservation when she was 16 years old, I tell my audience. 16 sounds very old to me, but I always state the number 
because it seems integral to my recitation. She had never been on a train before or used a telephone. She left Standing Rock to take a job in Chicago so she could help out the family during the war. She was petrified of all the strange people and new surroundings. She stayed in her seat all the way from McLaughlin, South Dakota to Chicago, Illinois and didn't move once. I usually laugh after saying this because I cannot imagine my mother being afraid of anything. She is so tall, a true Dakota woman. She rises against the sun like a skyscraper. And when I draw her picture in my notebooks, she takes up the entire page. She talks politics and attends sit-ins, wrestles with the Chicago police, and says what's on her mind. I am her small shadow and witness. I am the timid daughter who can rage only on paper. We don't have much money, but mom takes me from one end of the city to the other, on foot, on buses. I will grow up believing that Chicago belongs to me because it was given to me by my mother. Nearly every week we tour the historical society and mom makes a point of complaining about the statue that depicts an Indian man about to kill a white woman and her children. This is the only monument to the history of Indians in this area that you have on exhibit. It's a shame because it is completely one-sided. Children who see this will think this is what Indians are all about. My mother lectures the guides and their bosses until eventually that statue disappears. Some days we haunt the Art Institute and my mother pauses before a Picasso. He did this during his blue period, she tells me. I squint at the blue man holding a blue guitar. Was he very sad? I ask. Yes, I think he was. My mother takes my hand and looks away from the painting. I can see a story developing behind her eyes, and I tug on her arm to release the words. She will tell me why Picasso was blue, what his thoughts were as he painted this canvas. She relates anecdotes I will never find in books, never see footnoted in a biography of the master artist. I don't even bother to check these references because I like my mother's version best. When mom is down, we go to see the mummies at the Field Museum of Natural History. The Egyptian dead sleep in the basement, most of them still shrouded in their wrappings. These were people like us, my mother whispers. She pulls me into her waist. They had dreams and intrigues and problems with their teeth. They thought their one particular life was of the utmost significance. And now, just look at them. My mother never fails to brighten. So what's the use of worrying too hard or too long? Might as well be cheerful. Before we leave this place, we always visit my great-grandmother's buckskin dress. We mount the stairs and walk through the museum's main hall, past the dinosaur bones all strung together and the stuffed elephants lifting their trunks in a mute trumpet. The closed figures are disconcerting because they have no heads. I think of them as dead Indians. We reach the traditional outfits of the Sioux in the Plains Indian section, and there is the dress, as magnificent as I remembered. The yoke is completely beaded. I know the garment must be heavy to wear. My great-grandmother used blue beads as a background for the geometrical design, and I point to the Asia expanse. Was this her blue period? I ask my mother. She hushes me unexpectedly. She will not play the game. I come to understand that this is a solemn call and we stand before the glass case as we would before a grave. I don't know how this got out of the family, Mom murmurs. I feel helpless beside her, wishing I could reach through the glass to disrobe the headless mannequin. My mother belongs in a grand buckskin dress such as this, even though her hair is now too short to braid and has been trained to curl at the edges in a saucy flip. We leave our fingerprints on the glass, two sets of hands at different heights pressing against the barrier. 
Mom is sad to leave. I hope she knows we visit her dress, my mother says. There is a little buffalo across the hall, stuffed and sparing. Mom doesn't always have the heart to greet him. Some days we slip out of the museum without finding his stall. You don't belong here, Mom tells him on those rare occasions when she feels she must pay her respects. We honor you, she continues, because you are a creature of great endurance and great generosity. You provided us with so many things that helped us to survive. It makes me angry to see you like this. Few things can make my mother cry. The buffalo is one of them. I am just like you, she whispers. I don't belong here either. We should be in the Dakotas, somewhere a little bit east of the Missouri River. This crazy city is not a fit home for buffalo or Dakotas. I take my mother's hand to hold her in place. I am a city child, nervous around livestock and lonely on the plains. I am afraid of a sky without light pollution. I never knew there could be so many stars. I lead my mother from the museum so she will forget that sense of loss. From the marble steps, we can see Lakeshore Drive spill ahead of us, and I sweep my arm to the side as if I were responsible for this view. I introduce my mother to the city she gave me. I call her home. Now, Susan Power is a brilliant, brilliant writer, and she is going to challenge us at a really fundamental level to try to answer this question about what we will sometimes call culture clash. Culture clash. When two cultures collide, and what's the way it works out? But notice this perspective is a perspective from a modern view, right? Now let's work through it at level one real quickly. You've read the text. Now jot down at level one just a single line. If, for example, somebody were to ask you, uh, you know, what, what did you study? You could say, you know, this interesting, this interesting text called uh, Museum Indians, right? And uh, by Susan Power. And, and somebody would say, well, what's it about? Can you reduce it to a single line? Go ahead and give it your best shot to write it down to a single line. What is it that's being suggested in this text, all right? Well, let's list a few things. We could say, this is a story, an essay, a reflection about what it means to grow old, what it means to be young, what it means to try to hold on, and what it means to learn to let go. The letting go is always the challenge, right? And you'll notice here, also, we've got something generational happening. Wait a minute, what does that term mean, generational? Right, you've got a mother and you've got a little girl. Notice the story begins with a snake. It ends with a buffalo. Now that's interesting. What do you mean a snake? This story doesn't have any snakes in it. The little girl sees her mother's long hair. It's like a snake. Now that's an interesting thing. Notice what she asks her mother at the very beginning. Ma, why did you cut your hair? Jot down in your notes at level 2, A. How is cutting of the hair a symbol for loss, for change? Notice her mother comes all the way out from the Dakotas to Chicago. She's so afraid. Why? Well, she's moving now into a culture that is not her culture. She's going to live in a place that is not her home. And she has to somehow accommodate. But then she has a daughter. The daughter, by the way, of course, being raised in the city, in Chicago. So how does she try to help her daughter? She takes her to museums, rooms where the dead are going to be shown, where the old is going to be shown. The little girl, of course, is being educated by her mother. Notice her mother is a great storyteller, yes? Her mother tells her stories. She says, I like those stories better than anything else because the stories can connect her with her mother and her mother's legacy, her mother's heritage, her mother's past. 
Of course, there is this meaning of images. You've got two of them that are quite brilliant, and your textbook has done a nice job of positioning them for you right there on two separate pages. On 37, you have one of Picasso's classic, classic paintings, right, of the old man, right, the blue period it's referred to for Picasso. And then to another museum where you're going to see this, this garment. Of course, her mother will begin to express some of her anger. Jot down for, you, for yourself in your notes, what is her mother's hang-up with the one monument that is in front of the museum that shows, remember, again, an Indian man killing a white woman. Notice I'm on page 36, right? In front of the historical society. This is only the only monument, right? The only monument to the history of Indians. And it's completely, she says, one-sided. One side. Think about what that term means. The way we learn to see the world is inevitably going to be one-sided unless we make an attempt to see it from another perspective. Think about the way that this essay challenges you to try to see the world from another perspective. And of course, brilliantly, this is done at the end of the essay with two icons. One a garment, and two, a stuffed animal. Now, of course, both of those are going to be symbols, so let's jump to 2B real quickly. What do both the garment, the dress, as well as the buffalo symbolize? What do they represent? Go ahead and write down real quickly at 2B. What do they represent? What do they mean to the mother? Who, of course, sees both of these icons in this museum in good or happy ways or sad ways? Right, notice, sad ways. Many have argued that the most brilliant moment in this essay happens on page 38. It's a powerful word picture. You've got mother and daughter, see it in your mind's eye. Mother and daughter both standing in front of the exhibit of this dress. The mother saying out loud, I don't know how it got here, and I really don't like the fact that the mannequin they put the dress on doesn't have a head. There's something fundamentally unhuman about this whole thing. But then notice on page 38, we leave our fingerprints on the glass. Two sets of hands at different heights. Why different heights? She's the little girl looking. The mother is also looking, hands on the glass. So you got different heights. The heights, of course, representing the differences in what? So you want to jot that down. This is a brilliant moment in this essay. This essayist, Miss Power, is writing, making powerful comments about how the child's going to see this whole project different from the mother, isn't she? But notice the fingerprints are both left on the glass. What's often going to be the words that they will put on the glass cases? Don't touch the glass. An act of defiance by both of them. By the child, not so much defiance, probably just doing what children always do. But notice for the mother, an act of defiance to leave her hand there, right? And then the final icon of the essay, which is a provocative one, the buffalo. Which we know is a tragic, tragic story. There are stories of the early settlers who came out who would report, for example, that they heard a strange sound one reporting he thought the world was ending and the ground started moving. And he turned around and saw the ground moving for as far on the horizon as he could see. They went up on a little hill, rock, to stand there, these two settlers, and watched for hours and hours and hours, the stream of buffalo moved by. They reported later they couldn't see the ground. The buffalo were so packed so close together. And then into the night, and then into the next day, the buffalo kept moving for six days. They never saw the ground. Six days? The number of buffalo. 
There are stories about slaughtered buffalo lying across Nebraska that you could walk all the way from Denver to Omaha and never touch the ground. You could step on buffalo, carcasses, bones, number of buffalo slaughtered. So this icon, this stuffed animal, is going to be for this Native American woman representative of what? Well, see, all of a sudden it just comes full circle, huh? And you realize that at the beginning of the essay we're talking about hair that gets cut off. And at the end of the essay, of course, notice when she says, I am just like you. I'm on page 39. I don't belong. I don't belong. What makes this essay even more compelling, though, is the daughter now is no longer a child. She's writing this essay as a reflection. She's, however, old when she writes this, and she realizes that she doesn't belong. Jot down, where doesn't she belong? Notice the last paragraph. She says, I take my mother's hand to hold her in place. I am a city child, nervous around livestock, and lonely on the plains. I'm afraid of a sky without light pollution. I never knew there could be so many stars. Notice she finishes with what she will call home, Chicago. Whoa. There is the passing in this essay, and Susan Power realizes it. I am not a part of my mother's culture, of my grandma's culture in the same way. I look at the exhibits differently. I understand museums differently. I understand home differently. It all means something different to me than it does to her. And then, of course, finally, to go back to the title, Museum Indians. As opposed to what kind of Indians? See, that's interesting. Think about the irony of this title. Museum Indians as opposed to what? Well, what they once were, right? Real Indians. That is to say, they were a culture. They were people, and now, gone. But not gone. Why can we say that? Because we're reading this essay, which is to say, there's this amazing kind of connection, right? So we read a text like this to be somehow connected in a different way. All right, let's go to it really quickly, and we'll ask now about level three. Jot down at 3A. What is, for you, your favorite movie about the loss of a culture, about the loss of a, of a dynamic that we might call a family history. What is for you your favorite movie about the reclaiming of a culture? Let me ask it this way. What is for you your favorite story, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a book, where the daughter or the son do not get along with the mother or the father? Go ahead and write down your favorite movie for this one. Where the mom and the dad, they fight with the kids, because the kids don't get it. They come from a different culture. They come from a different time. A different place. The parents will yell at the kids. You need to do this or that. And the kid says, yeah, no. It's not for me. I don't buy it. I don't get into that at all. What about those three stories that we worked with? See, we're still at, two, at 3A, right? What about those three stories about... Native American origins. How did those relate to this? How does this give you a little bit different perspective on those stories about Native Americans? And finally now, let's talk really quickly 3B. A personal question. Have you ever been dislocated? Some students grow up all their life in New Orleans and this is where they get to live. Other students were brought here. Sometimes they didn't want to be brought here. What is it like to lose part of your past? Some of us live in the same house all our life. Others of us have to report, it's a different thing. I live in a different house. I sleep in a different room than I once did. I, I live in a different place. What's it like to come to a school that's a different school? What's it like to have that experience? There's two groups of us. One, those of us who can say, yeah, been there, done that. And that second group of us that say, yeah, I've never had the experience, but now that you're saying it, I guess it is kind of different. Lonely, coming to a new place, lonely, sad, scary. 
of course, to finish, all of us will have to graduate and all of us will have to go somewhere. And life will change for us after graduation, no matter what. What will that be like? What will it be like to finally leave the place you've grown up in and go somewhere else? What will it be like to have children someday, maybe, who will look at you like you're old? Isn't that strange? To look at you like you're somehow different. And you'll try and say, well, back when I was... And in that moment, it'll hit you. Oh, yeah, I always hated that when the old farts always did that to me. They always tried to tell me their stories. What will it be like to want to tell your story to a kid and the kid won't want to hear? Notice in this story, the daughter wants to hear. But at the very end of the story, the daughter's got to lead the mother home. Mm. It's like somehow the daughter has learned things that the mother doesn't know. How to live in this strange place, in this strange world. What's it like to live in a family, for example, where the mother says to the daughter, I want you to speak a different language than the one they teach you at school. What's that like? And the kid says, yeah, but I, 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 I want to be like the kids at school. What's that like? What's it like to live in different, different places all at the same time? These are all 3B questions, which kind of challenge our thinking, our perspective, our way of looking at the world, we might say. Thank you.